I'm going to introduce the panel while they're getting settled and everything, but come on out. Uh, Darren Fisher, VP of Engineering for Chrome. I feel like I should wave. And by the way, some of these may or may not be true. Probably most of them are true, but uh, Parisa Tabriz, who um, her business card reads Security Princess, which I am most <laughs> jealous of, by the way, always have been. Uh, Grace Kloba, lead of the mobile browsing team. Uh, Tao Tran, my co-presenter from this morning, um, fellow cocktail aficionado, <laughs> and uh, head of global, par global product partnerships for the web. Um, we are both looking forward to the nitro cocktail system, <laughs> by the way, by this point. Uh, Tal Oppenheimer, product manager on Chrome for Android, who makes sure Chrome and web works well around the world. Um, Matt McNulty, who leads the developer experience team for Chrome, um, has had to field complaints about me spilling coffee on one of his reports already today. Um, Alex Komorowski, who is one of my two favorite Alexes. And uh, they're, actually, they're actually not interchangeable, see if I say that for Alex Russell or not. Um, but Alex Komorowski is the group program or group product manager uh, for the web platform team in Chrome. And finally, Alex Russell, also one of my two favorite Alexes. Uh, this one's an engineer in the Chrome team. And he and I actually have shared this enduring mission in making the web a first class platform. We're super excited about where we are today. Uh, we work together longer than we've both been at Google, which is actually saying something, because I think we both feel like we've been at Google longer than average, at the very least, at this point. <laughs> and uh, we first met when I worked on the Internet Explorer team, and he was working on Dojo Toolkit. And he kept asking me really pointed, hard questions. Yeah, but he was always like, you were always so nice about you know, me asking you hard questions. And I was like, so were you about asking them in a nice way. So <laughs> I had to um, give some credit for that. So uh, we are using Slido for the questions. And I won't promise to take all the questions in order, but if you think of things, whatever, file them there. We actually are live moderating them during the panel, and we may pick them up and ask them. So let's go to Slido, and I, like I said, I won't promise to take these in order. In fact, I actually want to start with a different question, which is, where can I get the <laughs> dino sweater that Morocco is wearing? And so I kind of want Morocco to answer that question if she's... Okay. The answer is you can. It's my hand knit. Not only, so, the, the, not only the sweater, I also have a beanie. <laughs> and and here, they're all Which I gifted her. to Alex Russell last Christmas. <laughs> Thank you for bringing this up. Should I wear it? <laughs> yeah, sure. And they're, oh, fine. You get to put it on there, of course. Yeah, yeah so nice. if you want to get this, I, I do have a pattern if you want to knit it by yourself. And also, I, have a, I gave one extra one to one of the Chrome engineers, so you should talk to engineers and find out who has one and be nice to them and get one of them. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> OK, so um, you know what? I have to credit the number of votes for this question. So I think we're going to start with, does Google see AMP as a long-term solution or a temporary patch for the web's performance problems? Is the goal a fast web regardless of implementation, or is the goal AMP? Anyone? Well, um, <laughs> you know, we don't have the AMP team here to speak to this, but I think we can sort of uh, talk about how uh, we've sort of, I mean, we've been working with the AMP team a lot on AMP, and um, for sure we share the goal of making the web work a lot better, especially the mobile web, and performance is absolutely a big part of uh, the motivation for AMP. Um, the way I look at it is, that, you know, the question, the second part of the question there, is the goal a fast web? Absolutely, the goal is a fast web. And AMP is definitely an enabler there. We've seen people have a lot of success at building fast experiences. And again, I think um, this point was made today, uh, a couple of times at least, that AMP is really a, a built with web components. It's built with web technologies. It's in many ways giving people a lot of guidance on how to create a really fast experience. Uh, but there's nothing that keeps you from creating a great experience without AMP as well. And uh, I think we've seen a lot of content today, and you'll see more tomorrow that can help you do that. Yeah, and I want to weigh in here, and it's the long-term solution is a fast web. That's like, that's, that, that's really what the long-term solution is going to be. And when we talk to a lot of developers and partners, it's really about making sure that your performance is great, making sure that, you know, you're taking care of the overall user experience. And if, 
folks want to use AMP, if they want to hand tune your own, their own site, I think it's really up to, to them. And I think we really want to just make sure that we provide the right set of tools and features and give developers and partners a lot of options. Cool. Uh, let's go to the next question. Um, why was there not a PWA summit this year? An interesting one. I mean, who's supposed to plan it? <laughs> Chris, is that you? I forget. I don't... Chris, no, no, why I'm, didn't I'm you? Not, not a panelist. Come on, man. I just asked the question. I mean, I, I think really, because I am in the developer relations team, this is a conscious choice that it's not just about PWAs. And like we talked about in our talk this morning, this is really just the modern web. And yep. PWAs are kind of just a way of capturing that at a point and the whole focus on installability. It's super important for users to have a quick entry, but the web is more than that, too. And what you need to do, I think, is probably more than that. I and mean, I think of it the same way as I think of Ajax back in the day, or responsive web yeah. design. And a certain, at the beginning, it's like, oh, it's a thing that means something. And over time, it just becomes, well, duh, right? I, f I feel like we're starting to get to that point, uh, which is really cool to see. OK, next. Um, how? <laughs> Sorry, it's taking a second to update. Mm -hmm. Sorry, new tool that we're trying this year. Is it a PWA? <laughs> it, is, it actually uh, it ranks really highly in Lighthouse, but not a progressive web app yet. We are going to fix that, though, so it's fine. All right. Is it uh, it's missing a manifest or a service worker not running on HTTPS? Manifest. Manifest. We don't need to debug it on stage. <laughs> We can, we can so, run Lighthouse on it if yeah. we... You know, it's not that hard to create a manifest. I understand this. <laughs> I'm not going to create them personally for every, everyone. I tried to make it easy for people, you know. I, I did point out as moderator before the panel that I don't actually report in the same org, so none of these people can get me fired. And someone on the panel said, well, not directly. <laughs> So anyhow, John next question. Um, in August, Mozilla and Facebook submitted a JavaScript binary AST proposal to ECMA TC39, reducing JS parse times by 70 to 90%. Is the Chrome team interested in supporting a binary AST? So I guess I'll take this one. Um, so we work very closely with the performance team at Facebook, uh, who have done an incredible job at telling us what we do wrong, <laughs> which has been really outstanding, and helping us find places to improve. Binary AST is one way to maybe cut down on the initial parse time of loading large JavaScript applications, which, of course, Facebook is one of. Um, there are other ways that we can improve the loading times for applications that people use a lot, like putting the code that they're using frequently inside the service worker cache. We've seen large gains from that already, and we're very excited about being more aggressive about that. The binary, binary AST proposal has a lot of long-term consequences. Um, not all of which we think we understand entirely, and so we're trying to figure out the right way to think about improving uh, parse time. We're not sure that that's it, um, but, we're, but we are interested in improving our performance in that area. But yeah, cool. service worker cache your JavaScript. Do that. <laughs> Sorry, these are bouncing around a little. All right. Um, well, let's ask another fun one. Uh, so add to home screen in progressive web apps has been great for creating native-like user experiences. When can we expect to have this functionality on desktop operating systems? So I think we actually had Owen spoke earlier today about this. Um, so this is something that actually you can do. You've been able to do it for a while. You can, uh, it's kind of buried, but you can add an icon to a site on your home screen or on your desktop, I guess it's called, desktop. Um, <laughs> and to be honest, it's one of the things that's cool about PWAs is that in general, if you built these things in a responsive way, they just kind of work on desktop. Um, but it's not as clear about like, what exactly the user mental model should be in that context. On mobile, it's just it launches full screen. It just sort of takes over the whole app. Um, but as Owen announced earlier today in one of the talks, this is an area that we're actively investing in, and we're hoping to bring something uh, that will target the space in the next n months. I don't know. Look for it in Chrome flags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um... What would you recommend using nowadays? Use, sorry, would you recommend nowadays using ES6 directly or transpiling to ES5? Who are your users? I mean, if you've got an entirely ES6 compatible user base, please, by all means, it'll save you bytes on the wire. It'll save you a lot of hassle, especially if you're using web components, because uh, custom elements v1 does integrate with the 
native class syntax, and it's difficult to do that otherwise. Um, otherwise, you know, transpile. Look at your user base. Right on. In 2013, the Chrome team forked WebKit to build the Blink engine. Chrome now has a ton of nifty features not available in Safari, but developers hesitate to adopt those features because they don't work in Safari. How would today's web developers be better and worse off without the Blink fork? Wow. That's a really interesting one, huh? Um, I really haven't thought, I guess, about the counterfactual, what would have happened. And I want to hear better and worse, by the way, because I think I can think of both. Stick to I'm the show. Sure you can. <laughs> Well, one, I, one thing I will say is I'm, I'm very proud of the way the Blink community has sort of evolved over the years. We had our most recent Blink on um, in Tokyo just a few weeks ago, and it was huge. We had a ton of people there. We were maxing out the space. Um, and so it's been really cool to see lots of other companies come in and participate and build off of Chromium and participate in Blink as well. Um, I think ultimately we have goals of really pushing the web as far as we can and as quickly as we can and working with other browser vendors and at specification bodies to decide how to build these things. Um, and it's allowed us, I think, to move differently than maybe if it would have been had we still been sharing a code base, per se. But I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, one of the things you get out of competition is competition. <laughs> and that's something that we value heavily. Um, and one of the things that's difficult about sharing an open source code base is that in order to get code landed, everyone has to agree through a single governance system what should land. Um, having separate code bases lets us take a different view of what's most important. And we compete on different axes. And it's easier for us to compete with the Safari team in a more full-on way, which benefits everyone. So when we may benefit, when we may go deliver features that improve uh, performance in one aspect, they'll work on features that improve performance in another. And then we have to go figure out which is most important. And that, that is a great outcome, I think. Um, one, I, one extra, oh, good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that um, one, you know, one of the things that you might think is worse is that you might think that because there's two, that there's going to be more incompatibilities between the two. Well, you know, one of the things that informed our decision to fork in the first place was that we realized we were actually already forked. We if def the heck out of WebKit. And we were shipping features that Apple didn't feel comfortable shipping yet because of this very uh, idea that we actually wanted to like, really push and try to bring some nifty features to developers. We already were shipping things they weren't shipping. And so it's kind of like we recognized what reality was, and we realized we should just optimize for that reality. Um, and so that, that's really where we were at that point in time. We thought, yes, we should just fork. One thing that I think is worse is uh, we talk a lot at these kinds of events about the big, flashy new features that you can use as developers. But in your, our day-to-day -day lives, a lot of it is what random little edge cases work differently in different browsers. And when we used to be part of one code base, one change there would work, would make the beha that behavior of those sort of edge cases similar across the different browsers. And so actually, we invest quite a bit in this. We don't just invest in the cool, flashy features that we can talk about on stage here. We also have a bunch of folks uh, we call this a predictability effort that focus on cross-browser testing through web, plat uh, web platform tests. Um, and we also have uh, folks that land uh, changes to other open source uh, rendering engines to help fix some of those low level, like those issues that cause a lot of annoyance day to day. And that's one thing that requires active effort now that didn't back, wouldn't have if we hadn't gone our separate ways. I think on the same vein, there's a question about uh, if there's an interest in having team, several teams of very smart people who work on several rendering engines at the same time. Like, should we just cross-pollinate between those browsers, or should we just build one single browser that everyone ends up using the engine from? Should we have one JavaScript engine, right? I mean, as a former web developer, I can say with confidence that hell is other browsers, right? Like, it's very much the case that your favorite browser is your favorite browser, and compatibility with anything else sucks, right? It's just always going to be hard to get that. Um, and that's one of the unfortunate aspects of competition. But the benefit is that it means that there isn't a monoculture. Uh, if one browser engine starts to get stagnant and they don't continue to lead, then it's possible for someone else to come in and do a better job. And that's a huge and valuable thing that we've seen play out multiple times as long as I've been working on the web. Um, Chris, you might have some insight into that. <laughs> no comment. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. but in seriousness, I mean, I have actually a sociological background, and I, a lot of times we, we miss this, but this is one of the few examples where you have competitors who are also sort of cooperating. They're working together on standards. You're shipping things that are mostly interoperable, and they can compete on which features to offer and how to implement them. And that kind of competition, um, while still being interoperable, is pretty special about the web. 
And I think it's pretty fundamental. I also want to add one point is like uh, with multiple uh, kind of vendors working on it, it's increasing diversity. It's like mm. a different uh, like a group, different people having different opinions. What is more important versus a single voice? So. And some of the work going on in, uh, in Gecko right now is really interesting. A lot of really interesting approaches in layout that it's just great to see different engines looking at different aspects. So, um, sorry, just lost a question here. <laughs> So I think there's a lot of questions that sort of center around this topic of uh, Google seems to have somewhat of an identity crisis. On the one hand, there's a large push for progressive web apps in emerging markets. And on the other hand, there's things like instant apps. Why does Google continue to march forward with Android rather than doubling down when the core business is inherently web-based? And I'm totally throwing them under the bus on this one. <laughs> Anybody here from the Android team want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think you can transition from just the point of, of competition to some extent and, and recognizing there's uh, different needs and, and developers want different things. And that's actually not necessarily a, a bad thing. And you don't you know, want to say, like, this is the only way and we're only going to do this. I think I, I sympathize with the point um, uh, of hearing kind of a lot of different options for how to create content, and that maybe not having like a holistic narrative. Um, but I also think that uh, one of Google's strengths is actually not just sticking to one thing and like continuing to invest in, in you know, what, uh, what makes sense for this environment and mm -hmm. seeding like new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, meeting developers where they are. I, I know, yeah. Tal, you talk a lot about this when you reach out to developers, you know. Yeah, I was, I was going to say as well, the question itself somewhat answered parts of it. It highlighted that you know, progressive web apps do resonate particularly well in various countries that have different constraints. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is, is that different technologies can work better depending on who mm -hmm. your users are and who you're targeting and whether you're really aiming to have a lot of users from a lot of different areas or if you're really focused in on one particular set of users and how do you best match those. And so some technologies of progressive web apps work really well for those and other aspects that Android and native provides works better for other use cases. Obviously, we're gonna we're gonna trumpet like <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the, uh, awesome benefits of progressive web apps. But yeah. I also think it's it's not a bad thing for like the world to have options. Yeah, and I mean the user's experience is surrounded by stuff too, right? Like Chrome OS, I've always thought was awesome because it's really just the web, but it does have a user experience, and users get used to those consistent ways of interacting with their system, and they're different when you change different devices. So I'm going to have to go with my friend Jason Grigsby's question of, why does Google highlight AMP in search results instead of progressive web apps? When will Google Search have ambient badging for PDA, or for PWA? <laughs> <laughs> Never for PDAs. Wow. Never, for PDAs. <laughs> Never again, um, no. <laughs> and keeping in mind, because I'm going to channel Darren. You know, he's sitting right next to me. The search team isn't here, <laughs> so... We can say anything? We can say anything. Uh, yeah, like, whatever you say, I think they have to do, right? That's how this works. I, I think if you get more, if you get 76 votes, then we must legally do it, I think is what happens. We're at 75 <laughs> I'm going to watch that number roll yeah. up as you say this. I'm, I'm pretty sure Parisa's pillow is a, is huh? a spokesperson for the search team, right? Yeah. <laughs> what? I think, you, you, know, don't, so... what, you don't want a panel of Chrome <laughs> managers to be answering this question? Because we have no idea? Uh... <laughs> I don't know okay. if there's anything okay. for us to say. But if you Good think answer. about it, so when we talk about progressive web apps, we talk about you know, building best in class, building really great mobile web experiences, right? And what is Search really great at doing? It's helping you find great web experiences. And so Search already points you to PWAs, already points you to websites. Um, so, you know, and Search is very motivated to help, find, help you find the best sites, right? And we're motivated to help you build the best sites. So I feel like there's a lot of alignment there, and, and we talk about PWAs. We're not so much saying it's a different thing. It's, it's, it's the mobile web. It's the mobile web sites built well. And that's what we're here to try to help you uh, accomplish. OK, so on a similar vein, though, what's up with Google launching so many Chrome-only sites? What's up with that? What's up with that? We shouldn't be doing that. I, I Are we doing it? There was one last week I saw that was bouncing around on Twitter um, that we actually, every time we see one of those, we dive in like, oh, crap. Let me try to chase down the CL internally that led to it, reach out to the teams. We try to catch them beforehand, obviously. 
Um, I think this one was actually a, uh, it was an, someone using a very old version of Firefox. Uh, or or it was Firefox on Linux, which was incorrectly blacklisted. Um, I mean, ultimately, we try to make the case for lots of the other teams, a very large company, about the benefits of uh, progressive enhancement where possible, um, allowing developer users to access those sites, even if they aren't fully sure it's tested. Um, but I mean, on the, yeah, to be clear, we, I mean, everyone up here on this, this stage generally really, really dislikes it when a, a Google property does this. Uh, so yeah. we're some of the people that actually object the most to it. Yeah. And in fact, the whole concept around progressive enhancement is really um, it's twofold. One is, you know, there's a path forward for a developer to create an experience that can brace new features when it's available. And that allows them to create and experiment with new APIs and create experiences that are better for that set of users who happen to have the browser with those features. But it also tells developers of the other browsers that haven't implemented those features that that's actually a feature worth building because like developers want to use it. So it all really works well when um, when you kind of go down that progressive uh, enhancement path. And mm. yeah, and in general, um, you know, when it's possible to do that, that's, that's where I, I think with Google, that's mostly where the focus is. I think there's been just a, a few incidents recently where people have that motivate this question. And like we were saying, the last one was actually kind of a bug. Because mm -hmm. anyways, I should probably stop talking. But <laughs> <laughs> there are ways to do this better than not. So for instance, you could give users a link to let them continue to try it anyway. There are ways to communicate that you're expanding your browser support in the future. There are ways to you know, say, hey, here's why. Um, and those are things that we're advocating for internally. So come to us. You know, we'll advocate to the other teams on your behalf. That's, something, that's a service we provide. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I will say, I don't think the Chrome team has ever made any Chrome-only web services. At least well, let's not, not open that can. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But definitely treat the Chrome team as your, your helpers in this. Um, there's a lot of discussion around offline capabilities. I actually chose this question because this is one that I've thought about too. You know, that's great to have offline capabilities, but how much storage can a web page really respectfully expect to have locally? Like, there's likely an expectation from the user that you're not going to take a huge amount of space, store a bunch of stuff on their phone. How does this work when you have media apps like the ones we were talking about this morning? So we've changed this a lot recently. Um, For the better. Uh, yeah. Well, depends on who you are. Uh, we think that because it's not a, the contract we give web developers isn't the same as a native app gets, right? A native app gets as much storage as is available on the disk uh, without a lot of limits up until the OS says you're cut off. Um, we are the ones cutting sites off. So we impose tighter limits. Historically, they've been very, very low. I think the number that's still kicking around in some people's mind is 50 megabytes um, or 5 megabytes. Uh, those, are, those are pathologically low limits if you're trying to build anything serious. And so instead, we've shifted our implementation to look at the amount um, of total free space on the, on the device. And we've expanded the amount that Chrome is allowed to take uh, quite a lot. Because you might be using Chrome as the primary reason that you're on the device. So it's sort of comical that we would only take 15% of the total space. Uh, we've fixed that. Um, so now you'll see quite a bit more space available if you use the quota APIs to interrogate it. Um, but we also are trying to ensure that the sites that you engage most heavily with are the things that are kept or the things that you have more storage space allocated for. So uh, think of it like a big pool, and we'll throw the things out that you don't use frequently. So if your site engagement score is high, you're much less likely to get evicted. Uh, but the amount of space that a site gets is now largely unlimited. It's, and this is one of the places where the web has an amazing ephemeral model, where users don't have to be afraid to tap any link to go somewhere. And that's huge. It's foundational. But it means that some of these questions are very different. Like, when does a user expect to have more storage saved? And so there's things like, if the person, user is added to home screen, we're more likely to save, allow that thing to save more content, because the user would likely expect that thing to be able to save more things offline. And ultimately, it's about giving the developer ability to understand what's going on um, and, and have better control over it. Cool. So now for another fun one. Fun is in quotes here, in case you're wondering. Um, why aren't progressive web apps installable from Google Play? What's your definition of fun? <laughs> <laughs> I have a very twisted sense of fun. Well, I think there's a lot, of, lot to this question, right? And so you can sort of break it down into a couple different axes. Like one thing is that um, it, it, there already are, right? You can put a website in a web view. 
And so I think the question was probably asking something different. Uh, so we announced a trusted web activity today, which allows you to actually launch um, an activity of a component of your application that is powered by Chrome. And, what the role, and I think it was, it was explained that the reason for doing that is that you can actually share the cookie, ser cookie, cookie jar with Chrome and take advantage of Chrome's ability to help you fill out, help users fill out um, forms and so on. Those kinds of things are in stark contrast to the experience you get when you just uh, wrap a website with a web view, because users have to go through the login steps and all that kind of stuff, or you have to go and do a lot of work to plumb all of that in to the web page. Uh, so what we're, what we're doing with Trusted Web Activities is making that work better. Um, and so we sort of see that it's important that the developer um, is, is, in, is is there in control of the thing that they are ultimately uploading to the store, so they generate an APK, and we're giving them tools that allow them to leverage uh, the web, and in particular their investments in PWAs to help them build a great um, application that a user would find through the Play Store. Cool. So one final question, I think, and this one I actually want each of you to answer. So at Chrome Dev Summit 2027 on the leadership panel, when asked what you're most proud of with Chrome in the last 10 years, what do you think your answer will be? What do you think the best thing that we're going to do in the next 10 years will be? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to start over there, actually, because that way Darren <laughs> think about it the longest. You have the best He's the most likely to get me fired. The thing, <laughs> I, the thing I would be most proud of is the way the investments we're making now have enabled the web to survive the next form factor change. Mm. We didn't necessarily yeah. predict mobile. Um, we, didn't, we saw it coming from di some distance off, but we've now, I think, started to respond uh, adequately uh, with progressive web apps as a way to help the web survive in mobile and thrive and make a great product market fit with users uh, in emerging markets. And uh, I think if we do our jobs right, we will have done that for whatever the next form factor is, too. I think the, a lot of it is understanding the value of this competition between rendering engines and allowing that as sort of an engine underlying this, this thing. I think it's much easier, as someone was saying in here, of like, why can't everyone just work on the same rendering engine together? And I think that one of the things I'm most proud of is that we understand and can help harness that competition in a way that's really helpful and healthy for the ecosystem long term. You know, having started in a very different browser environment uh, during the browser wars, V1, for, even before that, um, I have to say, we've come a long way yeah. already. And I, I agree, though. I think we're, we'll do even better in the future. Um, I think I'd like to be proud of that we kept the user first, um, that we were like a yeah. particularly uh, noble and good steward for the user. And uh, uh, yeah, and kept them first. Yes, building off of that, for me, it would be all users and not just the ones that mm -hmm. look like us or have the background that we've had with the internet, with browsers, et cetera. And so making sure that it really is for everyone. So I'm going to expand Chrome just a little bit for just thinking about the web. And so it would be amazing if we look back 10 years and I'm able to you know, publish content or sell a pair of shoes. And all I have to do is build once, and it works everywhere. And I don't have to worry about so many different form factors and that it will be accommodating across whatever comes next. So for me, as because I'm leading the Chrome mobile, so looking at the Chrome from desktop to mobile, and about moving forward to, uh, another 10 years, I imagine there's going to be another new platform. So I want to see Chrome continue from desktop to mobile to this new platform and always there. Yep. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about the, the cross-platform Chrome story and, and making that just easy to access content across. But since you already said that, um, <laughs> I think yeah, you, can't, you can't just say me too. Okay, <laughs> me, me too, but also, or and also. Um, uh, yes. That, <laughs> uh, all right. Oh no, oh. you have to go in order. Yeah, you, you have to go in order. Can't take ahead of time. Yeah. So yeah, HTTPS <laughs> was what I was going to say, uh, and because Darren took that, I also look forward to a more secure and auditable PKI because that's actually one of the the uh, dependencies of secure HTTPS. And I think we've made a ton of progress the past couple of years to make it easier and cheaper and, and more affordable, um, but spending some time on, on having confidence in, in that piece of it. And, and other cool security primitives that are coming to the web platform that 
Um, I think we've learned a lot in, in native application software development with sandboxing and, and other defense in depth that it's cool to see these coming to the web platform and seeing those adopted. So. Yeah, 2027. So that means I would have, if How I was. How old are you going to be? Yeah, well, no. no. Okay, okay, sorry. But I, I would, I'll answer that by saying that, that if I was up here at that time talking about it, that would have been 21 years working on Chrome. Whoa. And I would just be damn proud of the team that got us there. And I would know that we did something awesome. Awesome. Even more awesome. Oh. <laughs> all right, I think that's all the time we have. So thank you very much. Thanks to the panelists.